Coming up, the nominee for head of DOT is up for confirmation. We've got the latest from the Hill. And it may be cold where you are, but Florida is full of sunshine. We take you to Sebring for the kickoff of the flying season. Plus, fields of gold, how farmers are using drones. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. It may not be 5 o'clock, but it's 75 degrees somewhere. Thanks for choosing AOPA Live this week. I'm Melissa Rudinger. And I'm Warren Morningstar in for Tom Haynes, who somehow managed to find those nice temps. He joins us from uh, Sebring, Florida, where the forecast high is 80 degrees today. The flying season is getting started with the U.S. Sport Aviation Expo. So, hey, Tom, what's happening in Sebring and how come you always get the warm weather gigs? Hey, it's a, a management prerogative, all right? What can I say? It is a great day to kick off the 13th Sport Aviation Expo here in Sebring, Florida. There's a lot new here at the show, even for show veterans, because the footprint of the event is completely new this year. The whole entire footprint of the show has moved from its old place, which was for 12 years, and we've moved it down to showcase our terminal, and we're really proud of that. So we have everybody coming from the terminal out to the apron, and then it goes north and south. While weather has hampered the show for the past few years, this week the weather is fantastic, as Warren said. In the 80s today and down into the 70s um, for the rest of the week, probably about between 22 to 27,000 people should visit us over the next four days. This show started out as a light sport aircraft show and has retained that flavor over the years. Dan Johnson says the LSA movement is alive and well, especially internationally. In 2014, Gamma announced that there were 969 deliveries of single-engine piston aircraft worldwide. These are all type certified aircraft, of course. In the same year, there were more than 3,000 LSA or LSA-like airplanes. But when you look at that, they almost triple the number of deliveries of type certified airplanes. So it's working globally, even if it looks a little flat here in the U.S. You can fly an LSA with just a driver's license for a medical certificate when you self-certify. Even though this, the FAA's basic med regulation is out there, Johnson sees an opportunity for LSAs. Some parts of the light sport no medical requirement are still easier than under basic med. So for some people, that's still going to be the choice. Like everywhere it seems, there's a lot of emphasis on drones here at the show, including drone races with a total purse of some $25,000, including a first place of $10,000. AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story. On this beautiful Florida evening, over 100 participants are competing in an Expo First drone races at the airport. Drone races bring a new segment of flying alongside traditional aviation. It's just another way to feel that same thrill, that freedom you get the moment you leave the ground to be one with the sky. All right, finish this lap. Chris Thomas is a fixed wing pilot, and like many drone enthusiasts, he's just as enthusiastic about flying a drone as he is about flying a Cessna. So here we can take that early interest, you know, especially as, as high school and junior high level kids are interested and not just let them go fly a radio controlled model. We can let them get in the pilot seat. The drones racing here are all first person view, which makes the flying experience similar to flying an airplane in many ways. So it's everything you dreamed of about being a fighter pilot with none of the risk of crashing the jet when you're flying it. The races aren't just about flying drones. Building them is another major part of the sport. Um, every single part is different. The motors, the computer that runs it, the camera that you see through. It's all, we can all pick and choose what parts we want to use and then build our own drones. Organizers hope holding drone events at airports will raise awareness of drone safety. This is the first uh, event of its kind to where the FAA is here. They're looking over our shoulders as much to make sure that we're safe, but to also learn about this new emerging sport. Drone races aren't the only draw to bring younger people into aviation. This year, Sebring is bringing hundreds of students. They started off the day with a talk from Sikorsky test pilot Melissa Mathewson. Uh, what really piqued my interest was the, the, um, the training. There's a lot of training you have to go through to become a helicopter pilot. It kind of just showed me what I, what I have to do. From drones to helicopters, the focus on youth this year is bringing many new faces out to the airport. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live.
Thanks, Josh. Expo organizers say they expect some 600 to 700 high school students to visit the show this week. And like AOPA's You Can Fly High School initiative to create STEM curriculum for high schools nationwide, it's great to see the emphasis on introducing youth to aviation. We have a couple of the AOPA You Can Fly team members here at the show, including Jamie Beckett. And it's Jamie that keeps that yellow 152 busy, visiting flight schools and flying clubs all over Florida. AOPA has four other ambassadors around the country. So guys, that's it from here in Sebring. Great to uh, be down here in the sunshine. We'll have more from Sebring next week in, in our show, so y'all stay warm now, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll try, Tom. You know, Melissa, it's really great to see all the things that are happening now with the uh, AOPA You Can Fly program. I think it's really gonna do some great work in getting people into aviation, and particularly doing the drone racing with the kids. That's gotta bring a lot of youngsters into, into flying. That's an exciting development. It sounds like they're ready to go big time, so I think it'll get a lot of good publicity for us. So if you're going flying, you want to be able to show it off on social media, right? Many pilots like to show off their flying adventures using action cameras, but finding all the right parts to make them work well in flight can be a challenge. AOPA Editor-at-Large Dave Hirschman shows us an action cam bundle that makes it easier to capture great flying video. It makes sense that an aviation company like Garmin would optimize its products for flying, and that's exactly what Garmin has done with its aviation bundle for the Verb Ultra 30 action camera. The key elements in the aviation bundle are a cage that allows for a USB hookup and a clip-on filter that reduces propeller distortion. The audio cable allows the Verb to record everything that's said on the intercom. Anticipate he's about to report by mile final or transmitted on the radio. That's now 117 Uniform Charlie is five miles. The filter is like putting sunglasses over the camera lens. It forces the camera to adjust by slowing the shutter speed and that reduces prop distortion. These accessories, combined with existing features such as an image stabilization, a one-touch record button, and remote operation through the Garmin Pilot app make the Verb a great camera to fly with. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. Wow, that's some beautiful video. The Verb Ultra Bundle costs about $500. Yeah, you know, Melissa, those action cams are really great for flying, and, and the Verb isn't the only option. You know, a lot of folks use GoPro. Nikon makes one. There are some others out there, too. But to reemphasize what Dave said in the thing, because I've worked a lot with these action cams, a neutral density filter so you don't get the scimitar prop. Uh, and that really makes the difference on the action cams. It, it noticeable in the video, and it looks like price points are coming down too, so they that's are. a good thing. When we come back, why the president has some pilots frustrated. And from the skies to the table, find out how drones are helping farmers grow our food. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft. Welcome back. President Trump is all about business, but the Trump presidency may send a few aviation businesses into a tailspin. Local newspapers have picked up the story that the so-called Winter White House in Mar-a-Lago will affect some six airports in the Palm Beach area. In particular, Palm Beach County Air Park, known to the locals as Lantana, will be closed when the president is in town, and that's because it's within 10 miles of the presidential estate. That's usually a general aviation no-fly zone. Last December, AOPA President Mark Baker sent the Trump team a letter saying the presidential TFR would have a negative impact on those six nearby airports. Those airports have a total economic output exceeding $1 billion. They create over 8,000 jobs and have a payroll of $290 million. Now, AOPA has been successful in the past getting TFRs modified to reduce the impact on GA. And uh, Melissa, you've been involved in some of those efforts to try to tone down the presidential TFRs. I have been, myself and my staff, and we're, we're actively working this one. It's a tough one. And that airport is really close to Mar a Largo, but we are, we've had meetings with security officials and the FAA, and we continue to work this to try and get some sort of relief for that airport. It's an important airport. Well, as an example, you and your folks got some relief on the uh, TFR on the Hudson River Corridor. 
Right. I'm, some of the folks in New York will remember when Trump was um, won the election, the, the, the corridor was closed, and it, we got it reopened pretty quickly. So, so we, we're hopeful we can do the same here. So we'll yeah. See. Well, good luck on that. Thank you. We're literally days away from having a new boss at the Transportation Department. This week, the Senate Commerce Committee sent Elaine Chow's nomination to the floor of the Senate, and the Senate is expected to vote its approval for her next Tuesday. The Secretary of Transportation is responsible for the FAA, but no word on where Chow stands on a couple of important issues to GA. And this is a huge issue that needs to have national consensus. And for that national consensus to occur, there needs to be a dialogue, a great discussion, a national discussion. The administration has not made a decision on this point, and uh, I expect that come January 20th, uh, this will be one of the issues in which the White House uh, will have some say as to where, this where the position of the administration would be. So far, no word from the White House on ATC privatization. Well, one thing the transportation boss and her FAA troops will have to oversee is the continued multiplicity of drones, uh, excuse me, unmanned aerial systems for the purists among you. Now they are used for everything from news gathering to recreation, but AOPA senior photographer Mike Pfizer shows us how they help farmers put food on the tables. I am Robert Shefflin. This is my family's airfield, Whiskey November 26, Shefflin Field in Palouse, Washington. I am an aircraft mechanic and I run my dad's crop dusting business and I am also a drone pilot for Major and a private pilot. Major is a company that puts drones to work for people. I help them in their agriculture department by flying the EB Ag drone. Um, this was my grandpa's aircraft and he bought it brand new in 1966 and it's still in our family. Sometimes I get to fly it to my job sites, which has been a lot of fun. Really a lot of my aeronautical knowledge from this airplane and from my private's pilot's license applies to this drone. A lot of it is making sure that I'm in a safe area, clear of airports, following all the guidelines, the certain elevations, checking um, notices to airmen, make sure I can fly in that area. A lot of it is checking weather. Even when I drive to my job sites, I need to know the weather beforehand. It can waste a lot of people's time if I commit to a flight and get there and it's too windy to fly or it's, it's raining. So my name's Robert Blair. I'm a fourth generation farmer in north central Idaho, a small town called Kendrick. 369 people and I'm the VP of Agriculture for Measure. The area we're in right now on the farm is a very special place for a lot of reasons. Just over the hill in front of me here is the homestead. That's where the farm was started in 1903 by my great, great, great uncle. The field we're looking at in the background is uh, garbanzo beans or chickpeas. It's 96 acres. We're overlooking the Clearwater River, which is the route Lewis and Clark took from Montana to the Pacific Ocean. In 2006, I started using a UAV. I found out later that I was the first farmer in the U.S. to own and use a UAV in the United States. When we put a UAV out into the field to take imagery for agriculture, what we're looking to do is take those individual images, put them in software to stitch it together to make a composite so we can see the whole field. And so from that, I can make management decisions. Do I need to spray? for a weed, insect disease. Maybe I have animal or wildlife damage that I can monitor and track. I don't have very many chances to get the perfect crop. And technology, especially UAVs, can help me do a better job of that.
Yeah, this should be a pretty easy flight. The weather's nice today, not much wind. Thanks for that. Okay, going to install camera and battery. Checking the camera, looks good. I just love how they make these connectors for farmer fingers. And the mission today is flying over garbs about 96 acres looking for animal damage. So we've just set up the path for the drone to fly, set up the perimeter, um, set up the ceiling. The flight plan is where the drone starts out and where the drone's gonna land and which direction the drone's gonna land. I look at my grandfather, I'm trying to answer the same questions he was 70 years ago. And that's how can we better our soils and better our productivity. Drones are transformative technology. We've had that in agriculture throughout history. John Deere's plow, McCormick's reaper, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, they all help transform agriculture through their technology advancements. And you can read more about how drones are helping agricultural producers in the February edition of AOPA Pilot Magazine. Gosh, Melissa, that was just gorgeous, wasn't it? It was beautiful, and the drone, actually, to me, it looked more like a, a, an eagle or a, or a bird of some sort, yeah. so it's just beautiful. Yeah, it was a, an interesting looking drone, and uh, Mike Pfizer, who is our premier photographer, just really does a wonderful job. And I also have to say that 172 was absolutely cherry. Beautiful and nice, nice story all and, around. And speaking of drones, you're not going to be here next week because... Yes, I will not be here. Uh, I am going to the Drone Advisory Committee meeting. It's out in Nevada, and uh, we continue to work on uh, implementing and, and seamlessly, hopefully, integrating drones of all sizes into the, our airspace system. So that's what I'll be doing next week. All right. Well, that does it for us this week. Uh, join us again next week for another edition of AOPA Live This Week. Thanks for watching.